welcome to the Neuroblastoma Parent Global Symposium. And welcome back if you joined us for the first session. My name is Lucy Jones from Neuroblastoma Australia. Now I'm going to be the moderator for the next session and the session is called Developing New Treatment Approaches to High-Risk Neuroblastoma. And this is being presented and delivered by the amazing Professor Michelle Haber AM, who is the Executive Director of the Children's Cancer Institute in Australia. Now, Michelle is actually a founding um, member of the Children's Cancer Institute starting there in 1984 and has spent 36 years conducting world-class research into the treatment of neuroblastoma and leukemia. Uh, was president of the ANR and is on the steering committee. So it's just an unbelievable wealth of knowledge on the subject. Um, so we're really delighted to have uh, Michelle be able to present today. Before I hand over, in case you weren't at the previous session, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A button which is at the bottom of your screen. And you can use that to submit questions during Michelle's presentation. If it doesn't appear, just hover at the bottom of your screen and it should appear. And you're also able to uh, tap on a question if you like it, which will create a thumbs up, which will also help us prioritize the questions that do appear. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Professor Michelle Haber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm just going to share my screen so that I can uh, start speaking with you all. So hopefully this will work. There we go. Are we on screen there? Um, and I'll just go to full screen mode. Uh, is that coming across clearly, Lucy? Lucy, is that all good? All right, I'll assume that it is. That's right, it's coming across well. Great, okay, thank you. So thanks everyone uh, for this. I'm delighted, as I said, to speak to you tonight about developing new treatment approaches to high-risk neuroblastoma. Now, um, at, at my research group, we focus on identifying novel targets and developing new treatments for children with the most aggressive uh, malignancies. And of course, that includes high-risk neuroblastoma. And what I'm going to speak to you tonight about is three different approaches that we've taken with our group uh, and our larger Children's Cancer Institute research staff. Uh, one is combining existing drugs with new treatments and the existing drug, an old drug uh, that many of you may have heard of is DFMO. Uh, and we're looking at combining it with a new drug called AMXT1501. Um, and together, these drugs um, uh, call, um, are used to give what we call polyamine, polyamine inhibition therapy. We're going to talk about um, two new drugs that we're working with that we think are very exciting for attacking new targets that we've identified in neuroblastoma cells, BCT100 and CBL137. And then finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the National Australian Personalized Medicine Program for Children with High-Risk Cancer that we've established called Zero Childhood Cancer. Right, so first talking to you about the polyamine inhibition pathway. So polyamines are essential chemicals required for critical cellular processes uh, for making DNA and protein in the cells. Now, cancer cells require very high levels of polyamines because they're rapidly dividing and multiplying. Now, we have shown that what it is that drives polyamines to very high levels in neuroblastoma cells is in fact the MIC-N or the N-MIC oncogene. And many of you, again, will be familiar with this. This is the gene that when it's present in very high levels or high copy numbers in neuroblastoma is a bad prognostic indicator. And when there's lots of this, we believe that one of the key reasons that it's very bad, that it's causing a very aggressive type of neuroblastoma is because it's driving high levels of polyamines. So we ask the question, can we slow the growth of neuroblastoma cells by starving them of polyamines? So here's a schematic of a neuroblastoma cell. Um, here are the polyamines. There are three of them. You don't need to remember their names, but they're putrescine, spermidine, and spermine. In case you're interested, and the main thing that you need to know is that when there are lots of the, when there are lots of these, these are required for tumor growth. How do we starve a neuroblastoma cell of polyamines? 
Well, the question is where do polyamines come from? And they're actually chemically synthesized from a precursor chemical called ornithine. So to make polyamines, you have to have ornithine. And there's an enzyme called ODC1 that is required for this chemical transition that, to make ornithine into the polyamines. And what DFMO does is that it irreversibly blocks the action of ODC1. So it can't convert ornithine to putrescine and therefore you reduce the levels of polyamines in the cell. So how did we begin our therapeutic approach here? We started this several years ago where we took neuroblastoma prone mice. These are mice that have been genetically modified to develop neuroblastoma spontaneously that replicates almost exactly the type of neuroblastoma that develops in children. And we treated these mice either with a standard chemotherapy backbone of cyclophosphamide topotecan, or we combined that chemotherapy with polyamine inhibition. And the way we did that in this initial experiment is shown below. Now, the way you read these graphs, and there will be several of them, is on this vertical axis, we've got the percentage of mice that are surviving. So if you've got 100% and the graph is high and up here, that means that it's a really good treatment. If you see the line plummeting down like this, this means that all the mice are dying. And then along here, the x-axis is the length of time that the mice survive. So here you can see when we treated the mice either just with saline, that salty water, that's a control that we use to give them something, but there's no actual drug. Or if we treated them with 1% DFMO alone, which is equivalent to the clinical dose, or if we treated them in combination with DFMO plus Celebrex. Now Celebrex is another drug that reduces polyamine levels in the cells, but instead of blocking the synthesis, it enhances the breakdown of polyamines. And we figured that maybe this combination would be very effective at reducing the polyamine levels in the cells. But you can see that none of these three treatments were very effective. All the mice died very rapidly. By comparison, here, we're looking at the response of the mice to cyclophosphamide topotecan. And you can see that we've extended the lifespan of these mice to nearly 20 days, but then they all, they all died. What happens then when we add to cyclophosphamide topotecan, the combination of DFMO and this second drug Celebrex, which also reduces the polyamine levels in the cell, we got this curve here. The mice remained alive for much, much, much longer. In fact, almost four times as long as when they were given just chemotherapy alone. So this looked pretty encouraging to us. And on the basis of that and a whole raft of other data, which I don't have time to share with you tonight, but we can talk about if we'd like later, um, we uh, led an international phase one trial for patients with refractory or recurrent neuroblastoma in 14 at Children's Hospital in North America in Australia. And the clinical trial design was based exactly on our laboratory experiment. So DFMO in combination with cyclophosphamide, topotecan, plus this additional drug Celebrex. And we saw some very positive responses. There were some children in whom the tumors, even though these were relapsed and very far advanced children, that the tumors just melted away. And on the basis of that, the Children's Oncology Group of the United States, the largest children's cancer study group in the world, have actually got an active clinical trial going on at the moment in nearly 200 children's hospitals, combining chemotherapy plus anti-GD2 antibody. And they've actually got a randomization. So some of the children are given DFMO and some aren't to actually determine scientifically or to prove whether DFMO is adding additional value to the standard of care treatment. And that's ongoing at the moment. We don't know the outcomes of that yet. But I said that with our polyamine inhibition trial, our first one, we saw some very positive responses, but we also saw a number of children who didn't respond at all. So we've been asking ourselves the question, how do we deplete the polyamine levels even further and improve the effect of polyamine inhibition therapy? So let's go back to our schematic of a tumor cell. Here are the polyamines being synthesized from ornithine. We can block the synthesis with ODC1 so we don't get polyamines. But tumor cells are smart. 
And when you block their access to chemicals that they actually need, they find other ways of getting them. And so we now know that tumor cells that are starved of polyamines by DFMO will begin sucking up polyamines from the diet through the blood, and they will import them into the cell to replace the polyamines that have we've blocked from making. So we looked for a drug that would actually block this transport into the cell of these extracellular polyamines. And we figured that if we could combine these two, then this might be much more effective. And the name of that drug is AMXT1501. So the strategy is to simultaneously block creation and import into the cells of the polyamines. So what did we, how did we decide to do this? I'd like you to focus just for a minute on these eight circles down here. And what these eight circles are, are dishes of neuroblastoma cells growing in the laboratory. And we put the exact same amount of neuroblastoma cells into all eight of these wells. In fact, there were many replicates of them. This is just uh, representative. And this is two independent human neuroblastoma MICN amplified cultured cell lines taken from children with neuroblastoma, one called B2C and one called Kelly. So in these two separate cell lines, this is what it looks like where you just see plate the neuroblastoma cells and you let them grow. And you can see each of these black dots is a rapidly growing colony of neuroblastoma cells. When we added DFMO, you can see there are many fewer cells, but the colonies are still there, a bit smaller, but they're still there. When we added 1501 on its own, didn't seem to make a major difference, but look what happens when we use a combination of DFMO and 1501 in both of these cell lines. We absolutely wipe out these neuroblastoma cells. So that encouraged us to go to our mouse model, which hopefully you're beginning to be familiar with now. And this time we used two different treatment protocols. This time we didn't even wait for the neuroblastomas to develop. We just waited until the mice were weaned. And the reason for that is that we give DFMO in the drinking water. So we needed them to stop drinking milk from their mothers and be ready to drink milk in the laboratory. This was before the tumors developed. What we can see here, we gave them one of four treatments. Again, the saline control or vehicle, which is another word for that. So just no drug, DFMO alone, 1501 alone in red or the combination. And you can see that 1501 alone was no different to giving them no drug. DFMO slowed the development of the tumors a little bit by about a week. Um, and that's consistent with what we saw in the laboratory flasks. But look what happens when we give them the combination of 1501 and DFMO. Nearly half of these mice never actually developed neuroblastoma. And the ones that developed it, developed it much later. So instead of the mice all being dead by 50 days, we can see that many of these mice are still alive. And at the end of the experiment, nearly half of them were still tumor free. And this panel here, we waited until the mice actually developed the tumors. And then we treated with one of the same four drugs. And you can see again that either the control or the DFMO or the 1501 in this very aggressive tumor model did virtually nothing. And within five days, all the mice were dead. But look again here. We can see that um, the, the time uh, for these mice was surviving was dramatically increased. All of the mice ended up dying, but nevertheless, many, many weeks later. So how can we enhance this effect now? What happens if we combine polyamine inhibition therapy, DFMO 1501, with standard chemotherapy? Here in graphs A and B, we're using two different chemotherapy backbones. In this graph, we're using cyclophosphamide topotecan. In this graph, we're using irinotecan temozolomide. And you may recognize those as two standard treatment protocols. In the blue, in each black is the no treatment crash straight to the ground. Blue is AMXT1501 plus DFMO, pretty active in its own right. In fact, almost as active as the chemotherapy backbones, which are shown in red. In green in each case, 
This is a repeat of the protocol that we used in our initial clinical trial, cyclophosphamide, topaz, tecan, plus Celebrex. Celecoxib is just another name for Celebrex. Forgive me, Celebrex, DFMO, but what we used in that first clinical trial. And we used the combination of Celebrex, DFMO on the irinotecan temozolabide background. And you can see that the addition of polyamine inhibition is definitely better than chemotherapy alone. But look at what happens when we add 1501 to the four drug combination in either of these protocols. Here, we have 50% of these mice now becoming long-term survivors. And here on the backbone of irinotec and temozolomide, when we add DFMO and 1501, most of these mice are still alive. So in summary, we believe that the polyamine pathway is an exciting new target in neuroblastoma. We believe that it's best targeted by a combination, by combined inhibition of polyamine synthesis and uptake using DFMO and 1501. The good news is that DFMO 1501 is already in phase one trials for adults and is very well tolerated to date. And on the basis of this exciting data, there's an international trial of this approach for neuroblastoma currently being planned with our clinicians in Australia in partnership with the clinicians in the USA, Europe and the United Kingdom. So our next question was, are there any other aspects of the polyamine inhibition pathway that we can harness therapeutically to treat neuroblastoma? And the answer is yes, we think there is. And that's by targeting yet another chemical, this time called arginine. Now, how does that play into the picture? Let's go back to our schematic. There's ornithine to polyamines being blocked by DFMO. But where does the ornithine come from? The ornithine itself is actually made from arginine. And the chemical transition from arginine to ornithine is dependent on yet another enzyme called arginase 1. And BCT100 blocks arginase 1. So we, uh, this is just a little bit more explanation of what's happening here. BCT100 is a synthetic drug which actually breaks down arginine. And it's developed, arginine is critically required for the cell. And it's developed for arginine depletion therapy in cancers which can't make their own ornithine. They have the name oxytrophic. And in fact, neuroblastomas are oxytrophic because they lack the enzymes that are required to make arginine by any other way. So you can see here BCT100 blocking this transition of arginine to ornithine and then ornithine going off to make the polyamines. And so when we add BCT100, we get cell death that you can see over here. So currently, BCT100 is in phase one, two clinical trials in relapsed refractory cancers of children and young adults right across the board of all the different various cancer types. But we were interested in seeing what could we do specifically with neuroblastoma with BCT100 better than having it just as a single agent. So what we did was that we took BCT100, first of all, to see whether we could see a dose response. And here again, we're in our neuroblastoma prone mouse model, and we treated, treated them prior than tu to tumor development. As you've seen before, by about 50 days, all the mice developed tumors in the absence of any treatment, and they're all dead. When we gave them BCT100 twice a week, they all died, but the development of the tumor was significantly delayed. When we gave them BCT 104 times a week, then we began to develop mice that actually be began to see mice which never actually developed neuroblastomas, showing that it was stopping the growth of the neuroblastoma tumors in their tracks. So what we then did was that we took this very effective dose of BCT 104 times a week. You can see it's quite active on its own by comparison of the backbone of irinotec and temozolomide. But when we combined irinotec and temozolomide and BCT 104 times a week in mice that had actually developed tumors, we can see that it cured the majority of the mice. Over 60% of this mice went on to become long-term survivors. So in summary, a phase two study of BCT100 as a single agent in children with 
relapsed refractory solid tumors, including neuroblastomas, brain tumors, and leukemias, is currently underway. And our data, we believe, support further trials involving increasing doses of BCT100 combined with chemotherapy as a potentially exciting new approach for treating high-risk neuroblastoma. All right, I've got one more new target to talk to you about before talking about our personalized medicine program, and that's FACT. Um, I'm going to tell you a minute what that is, uh, but basically it is a, its long name is facilitates chromatin transcription, but what you need to know is that it's essential for remodeling the genetic material inside the cell that's required for cell replication and division, so that if we block fact, the cells can't divide and multiply. Now, we were very excited when we saw that the highest levels of fact were present in aggressive primitive cancers, just like childhood high-risk neuroblastoma. We found that there were very high levels in normal tissues as against the, sorry, very low levels in the normal tissues by comparison with the high levels in the cancer cells. And that's great if we've got a target that's specifically present in the tumor cells, because it means we can avoid, hopefully, the side effects that we see um, with standard chemotherapy that attacks both the normal and the cancer cells together. Whereas we hope that targeting FACT might only hit the tumor cells. We were able to show that FACT regulates the levels of the MICN oncogene or NMIC and that it's present at very high levels in neuroblastoma. So FACT is driving higher levels of MICN. And so there was lots of FACT because then MICN in turn drives FACT and these two were pushing the cells to have high levels, which meant that they would be very easily able to divide and multiply. We showed that high FACT levels were associated with poor neuroblastoma outcome. But importantly, we showed then that if neuroblastoma cells would genetic, if we genetically silenced fact in the laboratory, the neuroblastoma cells died. But how would we do that in patients? And the answer is that there's a new drug called CBL137, which targets fact. Now, the exciting thing about CBL137 is that it is a non-DNA damaging drug. Now, you can see here that CBL137 slips nicely into the chemical structure of DNA this is the double helix of DNA, but it doesn't damage it. And the reason that that's important is because it's damaged to the DNA by chemotherapeutic drugs, which is responsible for all the horrible late effects of chemotherapy. So we were excited because this looks like a non-DNA damaging drug that we thought would be pretty safe. In fact, it's been in adult phase one clinical trials for the past two or three years. And the reason it's been there for so long is that it's taken that long to find a dose that actually induces side effects. So a very, very safe drug. But we're now at the point where we're just about ready to be opening the pediatric clinical trial. We believe that like most childhood cancer treatment, it's not gonna be a single drug alone that cures neuroblastoma. So we look to see what happened when CBL137, which in each of these graphs is the gray line, was combined with some of these standard drugs that are used to treat children with neuroblastoma. And in every case, you can see that by comparison with the chemotherapy alone, cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide alone, there's cyclophosphamide CBL. There is etoposide alone, etoposide CBL. Cisplatin alone, cisplatin CBL, then Christine alone, then Christine. You can see that the addition of CBL137 massively improves the responsiveness to the chemotherapy agent. And most excitingly, we've recently shown that if we combine CBL137 with a relatively new targeted drug called panabinostat, we've got 100% of our mice surviving. And we asked the question, why might this be? We looked at the mechanism of action. And what we found was when we looked to see which pathways were activated in the tumor by the comparison of CBL panabinostat, look at the ones that came up. 
immune system process, innate immune response, immune response, inflammatory response. And here is a complex cellular network of all the steps in an immune signaling pathway. And you can see that virtually every step is lighting up red. That means that it looks as if we've elicited an immune response from this combination. And it's if it's acting as an immunotherapy, harnessing the child's own immune system to attack the tumor. So in summary, CBL panabinostat results in 100% survival of these neuroblastoma prone mice. It appears to induce an immune response and it appears to be a safe, exciting new treatment approach for high-risk neuroblastoma and potentially other childhood cancers as well, where we've also shown it to be effective. And this is just a wonderful group of people in my laboratory and um, around the world who have contributed to the data that I've shown you so far. Then in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to share with you our Zero Childhood Cancer Comprehensive Precision Medicine Platform for Australian Children with High-Risk Cancer. The rationale for this program is that at any one time in Australia, there's over 2,000 children and young adults who are being treated for cancer or at risk of relapse. We have about a thousand new diagnoses every year in our country across the age naught to 21. And while 80% of these on average will do very well, 20% of these children annually will have refractory cancer or relapse and most of these will die of their disease. And as I'm sure so many of you know, treatment options for these high-risk patients is very limited. And even for those children who do survive, there can be serious late effects from standard therapies. So our view was that there was a critical need for more efficient, targeted and safer therapies. And so we established Zero Childhood Cancer, which is a very comprehensive integrated approach, which while on the one hand has one of the world's most comprehensive um, genomic or genetic sequencing platforms where we sequence the entire DNA of the child's tumor. We sequence the RNA, which gives us an indication of the activity of the tens of thousands of each of the genes in the child's tumor. And we do methylation analysis, uh, which also gives us an indication of which genes are active or not. We then combine that with preclinical drug testing where there's enough tumor sample available. We take the child's tumor cells, we grow them in the laboratory, or we put them into avatar mice. So we actually transplant the tumor into genetically modified mice that allows the tumor to grow in the mice. And then we treat the drugs in the laboratory or the mice with various different targeted or chemotherapeutic drugs to empirically determine which ones that child's tumor is sensitive to. And then we discuss these patients at a national multidisciplinary tumor board of over 50 people comprising the clinicians from the eight child cancer treatment centers around the country, plus the uh, by the data people, the geneticists, the pathologists, the biologists, all of whom discuss this data. And then there's a zero recommendation report issued to the treating clinician wherever in the country they may be treating their patient. This is the journey of the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. It started as a pilot in 2015 with the clinicians at the Kids Cancer Centre at Sydney Children's Hospital, working with our scientists at the Children's Cancer Centre to initiate a, a, initially a pilot study in 2016 and 17 of more than 50 children with high risk or relapse cancer. So the eligibility criteria for each child was less than a 30% chance of survival. We opened a national clinical trial in 2017 with the goal of enrolling 400 Australian children with high risk or relapse cancer. And we're right on target to complete that number of children before the year end with the goal that by 2020, this precision medicine approach would be available to every high, high risk child um, in the country. And here we've just published the results of the first 250 children who've undergone this comprehensive genomic profiling and note that 70% of them were, neuro sorry, 7% of them were high-risk neuroblastomas. And we published this in one of the world's top three or four medical journals, Nature Medicine. We were able to get the data analysis done and completed and back to the clinicians within nine weeks. We were able to identify the specific genetic changes in the child 
child's tumor that was driving their cancer in 90% of cases. In over 5% of cases, we actually changed the diagnosis when our genetic analysis indicated that the analysis that had been made by the pathologist was actually not correct. And that's a major issue because of course the treatment protocols are chosen based on the diagnosis. We were able to uh, generate a, 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 a treatment, personalized treatment recommendation in over 70% of cases, at least one, and in many cases, more than one. And 32% of these patients to date had received their recommended personalized therapy. And the best news of all is that over 70% of these children who received their recommended personalized therapy, they actually had a complete or partial response or their disease was stabilized. And when you think that these are all children who were pretty much at the end of the line, having exhausted all options, these responses exceeded all our expectations. So where to from here? We're very thrilled that earlier this year, we received funding from our Commonwealth government to be able to roll out zero childhood cancer, not just for the high risk children, but for all children and young people diagnosed with cancer in Australia over the next three years by 2023. So we've got a big job ahead of us, but we believe that this is a key part of achieving our goal of one day having no, having zero children dying of cancer. So on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'll just, I'm sorry, I'll just actually in acknowledge uh, the, the huge team that's been involved in this program and our funding so, uh, sources. And this is Jack, one of our great success stories who was nearly dead from a brain tumor and is now fighting fit and healthy. And that's the outcome that we want for all our children. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's, it's just an amazing presentation and we're also excited to see. Lucy, you've just gone on mute for me. I'm not sure. Ah, there. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that amazing presentation. It was just uh, it's so exciting to see all the, the research that you're doing. We have got a, quite a number of questions that have come through. So I'm just going to start off uh, going back to the polyamine uh, DFMO discussion. Yep. Uh, question one, is the polyamine inhibition therapy with DFMO only for children with MNIC amplified tumours also suitable for refractory relapse cases who, who would then also qualify for trial? Yep, we don't believe that this is just for NMIC amplified cases. When we, uh, I showed you some of the results that we had, but in our mouse models, we had mouse tumors, um, mouse models that were for single copy um, MIC-N as well as MIC-N amplified. And so uh, this is a protocol that will, we, will be available, uh, we hope through our trial design with all for all children uh, with neuroblastoma, irrespective of MIC-N status. But we are in the process of just doing an experiment where we've got the avatar mice from 30 different children uh, with neuroblastoma. This is being done in partnership with Jamie Fletcher. And we've got the whole range of neuroblastomas with different types of biology. And we will be testing this treatment against all of them to get a clearer indication of the particular types of neuroblastoma, the particular types of genetic changes in neuroblastoma, which may be most responsive to the treatment. And we actually hope through that that we'll be able to develop a biomarker which will tell us which cases might be most sensitive to polyamine inhibition therapy. But at the moment, our data suggests that it's going to be valuable across the board. Thank you, Michelle. And just on DFMO, somebody's mentioned, obviously, in, the, in America, there are children already using DFMO as an add-on after completing first-line treatment. And just to clarify, what's the difference between your work and that work that's currently taking place? So this is the, I think, the Giselle Scholler study through the BEAT um, cancer consortium. Uh, it's a much lower dose of DFMO that they use in their studies. Uh, we're using the doses that we optimized um, in the that first clinical trial with the combination of cyclophosphamide, Tobitik and Celebrex DFMO. And we showed that for real efficacy, sorry, not for efficacy, we, when we dose escalated, we went as high as we could and then we dropped back a dose. And 
all of our laboratory experiments indicate to us that it's the higher doses of DFMO that are critically important to getting good polyamine inhibition. And so those doses have been, those high doses have been uh, replicated in the COG clinical trial, and they'll certainly um, will be at the higher dose range in our international DFMO 1501 clinical trial. So it's quite a different concept actually to the low dose sort of maintenance therapy that's being used in that study. This is a much more upfront aggressive treatment approach. Thank you, Michelle. Um, a comment we have is saying an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. One generic question about polyamine inhibition and diet. How critical are the nutritional restrictions during the therapy? Are there foods that are going to interfere with the drug's efficacy by feeding the tumor extra polyamines that would have been blocked otherwise? I don't know if you can answer that question. Well, no, I think I can because you know, this was always a debate whether polyamine dietary restrictions were necessary because of that exact dilemma that I put up before, which is that we know that the cell, the tumor cells can grab polyamines from the diet. The great advantage of the AMXT 1501 DFMO combination is that it blocks that completely. And it really is an amazing blockage. You can have them swimming in polyamines, extracellular polyamines. And if you've got 1501 in there, you will not get any polyamines in, taken up into the cell. So this, I think, will be one of the great advantages that is that it will put parents' minds at rest that the dietary aspect is not an issue specifically because we've blocked that pathway. Great, fantastic. Is, it, is overall the DFMO and MXT1501 a kinder approach with less, less toxicity than the normal cyclophosphamide combinations? Uh, yes, look, we think that it, it will as well. One of the things that will be marvellous when we actually get into clinical trial is looking to see whether one might be able to, certainly in neuroblastoma, where you could see that the data was so much better when it was combined with chemotherapy. So we're not likely to give it just on its own. It's interesting, there's a parallel brain tumour trial going ahead because we've also tried this same treatment in our models of DIPG, which some of you may know is one of the worst um, childhood cancers. And in that, the combination of DFMO 1501 on its own actually seems to be remarkable against a DIPG when virtually nothing else works. In our neuroblastoma models, the approach that we're going to be taking is to combine it with chemotherapy because many of these children will have been multiply pre-treated before that. So we need to give them the best shot. Our hope is that if it's as effective as we think it will be, that we'll hopefully be able to give lower doses of chemotherapy because we'll have the additional effect of polyamine inhibition therapy and therefore that it will be a safer um, and a kinder treatment with fewer side effects, which is obviously one of our key goals. It's not just about survival, it's quality of survival. Absolutely. I'm going to move on to a um, question on CBLO 137. Um, somebody was asking regarding actually, is there a trial underway? I understand there isn't one just yet. Um, but additionally, is it only particular neuroblastoma genetic mutations that this works for? No. So first of all, you're right, the trial isn't yet open, but I'm very pleased to say, Lucy, that um, all of the final paperwork is pretty much sorted. And after this incredibly long adult trial, as I said, because it was so safe, they could not reach a dose limiting toxicity, which is what you need to go into trial. But of course, that's incredibly good news for children if you've got something that's that safe in high doses. So we hope the trial will open next year, early next year. Um, and at the moment, we have no markers of which particular neuroblastomas are likely to do better or worse, but we will be investigating that very actively um, because the first clinical trial, of course, will be all comers. It's not just neuroblastoma. Um, and while that's going on, we'll be looking to see if we can indicate for the neuroblastoma specifically, which are the tumors, again, from our um, avatar mice design, looking to see whether some of these might be more sensitive than others. Great, great news. Um, question going to the BCT100, why was the study um, developed as a single agent study in a range of tumor types and not as a trial in neuroblastoma, combining it with chemotherapy 
given the preclinical data that you have? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the same as why are we not going into combination therapy with CBL-137? Um, and that's because the, um, the, the clinical trial groups tend to want to get safety and efficacy data on an agent as a single agent before they expand into combination or expansion or combination groups. It, you know, I have to say as a researcher, this sometimes frustrates me because I think, look, I know it's going to be better in combination, but we have to go through the safety protocols. We have to go through the strict protocols that um, require us to do this. And therefore, that's why CBL-137, just like BCT-100, is single agent. And when you know that you've got safety, and even if you've got some signals of efficacy, even though it's a phase one uh, phase one trial, you can then fairly rapidly move to expansion in combination cohorts. And that's exactly what we'll be doing. That's good to, good to hear that. So I'm going to move across to zero now. Um, yes. Question is why is there such significant discrepancy between the number of cases where personalized treatment was recommended and the number of children who actually received this treatment? Okay, so that's because this isn't a therapeutic trial. We're not actually trialing the drugs on this trial. The decision to give the targeted drugs lies in the hands of the treating clinician. We're just moving to this expansion of zero now. And in that, we will be going to basket trial designs that are aligned to zero where the, we will be matching drug to target and the children will enroll on those trials. We, we believe that that's the way we're going to go. In this one, we, we've actually surveyed um, the treating doctors as to why the children did not go on to their personalized treatment immediately. And there was a range of treatments. In some of them, it was because they were doing well on the, on the therapy that they were on, you know, while we were doing our testing or um, independently, the clinician had decided to put them onto some new treatment and they were doing okay on that. So they hadn't gone on to that. And then the clinicians were holding the personalized treatment recommendation in reserve for if the children, if and when the children then failed that particular therapy. So there was a raft of reasons. Um, uh, in very few of them, it was because oh, drug access, which we had wondered about whether that would be a problem. We were very concerned about that, that we would be recommending treatments because most of these were off-label compassionate use. Um, but in fact, it was not a major problem. We managed to get access to most of the drugs, although in some cases, it was at particularly early on as we navigated these pathways, there were some children who passed away before we could negotiate all of the bureaucratic red tape that got us access to the drug. And that was very distressing. So we've now, uh, part of Zero is a national drug access framework that we're working on with Medicines Australia and all of the pharmaceutical com companies. We've now established a um, child cancer a working group of the Industry Oncology Task Force to make sure that drug access um, reduces or ceases to be a, in a problem for children. So there were a number of reasons, but we're reasonably confident that this was really a feasibility trial. Could we do this? Could we turn around the data in that amount of time? That The data analysis is unbelievably complex. We are, There's very few people in the world doing this. We didn't know whether we could do it. So the whole of this study was basically a feasibility study. We were frankly staggered at the efficacy results when we saw them. We thought we might slow the growth of the tumors in a few children. We honestly didn't know that we would have some complete responses or even partial responses or see so many children with the disease stopped in their tracks. So this has been a learning experience for us. We're just at the beginning of this journey and zero 2.0 as we're calling, are calling it that we're going to be rolling out from early next year where we're doing every child in the country and we'll be changing the clinical trial design that goes with it to make sure that more of these children can get their personalized treatment much sooner. That, that is fantastic and very, very exciting, particularly for all, uh, all people in, in Australia. And I have got a question on actual genetic testing in PRISM. Um, yep. Can you actually um, can do, can you do genetic testing in cancer biology with subsequent relapse? Now, when you say genetic testing, what do you, are you talking about the normal? 
Um, yeah, okay. So the way in which the Zero Childhood Cancer PRISM clinical trial, PRISM as it's called, for any of you who may not be familiar with that, uh, which means precision medicine in children with cancer. Um, the way in which it's done is that we not only sequence the whole genetic material, the whole genome of the tumor, but we also sequence the whole genome of the normal tissues in the child. And we have to do that because we need to see whether the genetic changes that we're seeing in the tumor were specific to the tumor, which are the ones that are likely to be the driver mutations that are actually pushing that tumor to grow or develop or whether they were actually there in the germline. But that means that we have the normal DNA from every child and that we can therefore see whether there are genetic abnormalities. One of the results that I didn't discuss, uh, which again was extraordinary from these first 250 children, we have found that 16% of them actually had germline genetic changes in their normal tissue. This is double the number that's been reported anywhere else in any other study because of the uh, incredibly um, um, high tech and the complex pro um, profiling system that we're using. 16% of these children who have genetic changes that probably um, contributed to why they got their tumor in the first place. So this is going to be taken over into the new Zero 2.0. We're going to be able to have a national child cancer predisposition study looking at all of this. We're going to set up a national child cancer predisposition registry. We're going to be sharing our data internationally. We're reasonably confident that we will identify that 16% were only the known cancer causing genes. We're reasonably confident that by sharing thousands of genomes of children around the world, that we're likely to identify new child cancer predisposition genes. And that the number of children who have these is actually likely to be much higher than we currently think. So yes, genetic changes are absolutely on our radar and very, very important. We have geneticists on our team. Parents have to sign up for consent that they want to know the results of their um, the normal germline testing. And we have almost you know, huge levels of compliance with that parents so far in our experience, very keen to do that. Um, and this is gonna be a major focus of the next study going forward. Well, that, that is fantastic so that you can and you continue to track the progression of all those children enrolled on childhood zero and the mutations throughout their journey correct we do and one of the other things that we're adding in we've just received a large grant for the equipment and we're just now um, looking to get the funding to recruit the workforce but to go to a liquid biopsy program and the advantage of that is that at the moment we're sequencing the genetic changes from a single biopsy at a, a critical point in time when the child relapses. But we know that the tumor continues to mutate. And the reason that children relapse and escape from the uh, effects of a drug which has been holding the tumor in check is that the tumor will have had more genetic changes. So what we need is to be able to get to a point where we can actually monitor the genetic behavior of the tumor in real time. Now we can't keep going back in and biopsying the tumor. It would be unethical, particularly if you've got brain tumors or tumors in you know, very difficult locations. Um, and so we, will, we are gonna be developing over the next two or three years, a liquid biopsy sample where we've now got very clear evidence that from the blood, we can find circulating in the blood, the DNA and the actual individual circulating tumor cells from the tumor. And we can then take a blood sample and do the sequencing on those. And that would mean that we can monitor in real time. That would allow us to predict which drugs children are going to become um, unresponsive to and then shift therapy in advance of that. That's what we see as the future. And to me, that's incredibly exciting. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, because everybody is very excited with what you're saying, Michelle, I've got questions like, can children from other countries join Zero? Um, at the moment, we don't have um, eligibility from other countries, but I do know that in the United Kingdom, um, my good friend and colleague Lou Chesla is setting up a very similar program. He's been, uh, you know, we've talked at length about zero, and this will become available very much, um, um, I believe, very soon and is being rolled out currently with a liquid biopsy component as well. 
Um, in the United States, um, their pediatric match trial is, is different to this because it's based on a panel of specific genetic mutations rather than whole genome sequencing. I think that our paper that we just published is going to change the way that people think because what we've demonstrated that although it was incredibly ambitious and incredibly complex and people said to us, you're nuts, you're never going to be able to analyze whole genome sequencing data in a clinically relevant time. I think what we've shown by that paper is that this is the technology that gives the most informative information that is dramatically, that's why it's got into this top journal because of the quality of the results. So I think there'll be more groups thinking very seriously about how to implement this in their own countries. Well, that, that's interesting to hear. I've got one last question. I think then I'm gonna have to uh, close the session. Um, are there any plans to do these targeted approaches on frontline therapy? Ah, not yet, but that is the goal. And that is the goal very fast. Um, I think as we're beginning to demonstrate efficacy in these relapse setting, it's very clear that that is the move. And we are certainly keen with AMXT 1501 DFMO um, to be looking at how rapidly we can move that into frontline therapy. So the answer is not yes, but watch this space. The clinicians around the world want to make this happen very soon. Well, but that's just uh, fantastic to hear the development that's going on. And, you know, we thank you very much, uh, Professor Michelle Haber, for joining us today and for all the absolutely amazing work that you do. Um, I know the audience has been very um, <laughs> amazed by the, everything that you've covered and all the exciting trials that you're involved in. And um, I think we better say thank you. And there are some questions we didn't quite get round to. And I know that the people will try and... Uh, We'll go through those questions and try and get back to the people who haven't had their questions answered in due course. But uh, thank you very much again, Michelle, for joining us today. Um, we have reached the end now of this session. Um, there will be a short break. We were up to five minutes and then you can join us for the next session. So it will be antrog treatment and trial update. So do come back in a short time. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>